Hello everyone, ready for this video? So, on today's video we will see all the different uh, antidepressant tracks in each class and see the little differences between them because on the last video we have seen already the main difference between each class of antidepressants so now we can go a bit deeper, let's go for it! So, let's start with the SSRI, so the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors so, let's start with Fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is known to be the one with the longest half time. So, if you look how it starts, it's flu, fluoxetine. So you can think a, a flu normally lasts around one week. And that's exactly the half time of fluoxetine. Then peroxetine. Peroxetine is almost the opposite. It is one that contains a really short half time period. So, because it's really quick absorbed, we will have uh, a higher amount of drug in a shorter amount of time so because of that it presents also a higher amount of side effects then sertraline sertraline is the best when there are some comorbid heart problems heart diseases so that's normally the chosen one when that happens and also sertraline is known to be the best one for women who is pregnant or breastfeeding citalopram and citalopram basically Escitalopram is just an antiomer of the citalopram. So, these ones are uh, considered by many psychiatrists the first line agent because it's the one that is best tolerated. And especially the citalopram, that's the cleanest one in terms of drug interactions. And lastly, we've got fluvoxamine. Fluvoxamine, it was actually the first SSRI to be done and nowadays it's not much used because it requires normally three times a day uh, dosage and there are many side effects with it. However, sometimes it can be seen for patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, so OCD. Then we got the SNRIs, so serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. So basically they will not only um, inhibit the uptake of serotonin but also noradrenaline. So the serotonin is known to be the happiness neurotransmitter, so the one that gives us satisfaction, whilst the noradrenaline is the one that gives us strength and activates all the body uh, to tackle any situation. So this drug tackles both neurotransmitters, basically increase them in the synapse, the gap between the neurons. So, by doing that, it's by itself maybe a better antidepressant, but there are some side effects associated with the fact that we increase the noradrenaline, and they should be taken into account. Let's start with the Velafaxin. So, Velafaxin is quite widely prescribed, it's a very good antidepressant, however, we need to keep an eye for hypertension, because it increases the noradrenaline in the synapse, the noradrenaline can have some effect in the cardiovascular system, uh, in us the heart rate and also make some vasoconstriction in our vessels so the blood pressure can go higher. That's not a reason not to prescribe this drug. However, if a patient has got a history of hypertension, then it shouldn't be given. The second one is duloxetine. So, duloxetine, in addition to its indication for depression, it can also be used uh, for pain. So if you think duloxetin starts with du, so you can associate du with pain uh, and then its indication is in neuropathic pain that can be used as well and also can be used for stress incontinence. And the next class is the TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants. But before we jump into this new class, uh, let me just encourage you to give a like to this video and if you are enjoying it, subscribe to the channel. So let's go to the tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, so as we have seen on last video about antidepressants, TCA's tricyclic antidepressants, they not only inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline, so increase those two neurotransmitters, but they also mess up a little bit with other receptors and channels. Uh, in our body. So they will also antagonize the effect of acetylcholine receptors and histamine receptors. So when they antagonize the acetylcholine receptors, patients may present antimuscarinic effects. So blurred vision, urinary retention, constipation, confusion, and also by blocking the histamine receptors, people may feel more sedation. And also on ion channels. By uh, inhibiting the sodium and calcium channels, 
That can be good in terms of mood stabilization, but it can be bad if we've got like high amounts of TCAs in the body because then there's some possibility for cardiac toxicity to happen. The first tricyclic antidepressant is amitriptyline. So amitriptyline is known to be one of the most sedative tricyclic antidepressants and amitriptyline is licensed to be used in chronic pain as well as nortriptyline, they are quite similar. Then imipramine. Imipramine was actually the first tricyclic antidepressant to be developed and imipramine can be used for urinary incontinence in children especially. Uh, you can remember that, like, I'm peeing in mipramine, I don't know if that helps. Because of their anticholinergic effects, it does prevent the bladder from contracting that much. Then we've got clomipramine. Clomipramine, it doesn't affect much the noradrenaline, but it is a potent serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So clomipramine is a quite good one to be used in obsessive compulsive disorder. And lastly, the lofepramine. So lofepramine, within the group of tricyclic antidepressants, is the best one in terms of toxicity profile and it doesn't show um, many antimuscarinic effects and also is the one that doesn't get such a significant sedative properties associated with it. So if we've got a new patient and we need to change it to a TCI, maybe lofepramine might be a good solution to start with. And finally, our last class, the typical antidepressants. So, on last video, I told you I'll talk more about these atypical antidepressants. All of them are really different between them. So, here we go. Let's start with mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is a tetracyclic antidepressant. It basically enhances the sympathetic output. So, mirtazapine is known to increase the appetite, so it's quite a good one to give to patients with anorexia. And also, mirtazapine is known to decrease the likelihood of experiencing nausea and also it can give some sedation, especially, and this is interesting, at lower doses. And then we've got bupropion. And bupropion is a dopamine and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. So, unlike the other antidepressants, this doesn't present any serotoninergic effects, so it doesn't affect the serotonin. And because of that, bupropion is mainly used to help people quitting alcohol or quitting smoking, for example. Then, the trazodone. The trazodone is an antipsychotic drug. Its mechanism of action is quite contradictive. So, it is a serotonin antagonist, so it has got like negative impact on serotonin, but on the other hand, it's also a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so it increases the serotonin in the synapse. So it contains negative and positive effects in serotonin. But that doesn't matter. What I want you to retain from trazodone, uh, it's, it can cause uh, sleepness, so trazodone, the Z, might help you remember that. So it can be given for patients that are also having some trouble sleeping and also trazodone, it doesn't give any uh, weight kinds normally and also trazodone can lead to priapism. What's that? So priapism is basically an erection that can last for several hours. So if we give this drug to a man, we should make sure that they know about this because that can even uh, become a medical emergency. Then the next one is agomelatine. The agomelatine is basically a melatonergic agonist. So basically it acts like our melatonin. It restores our circadian rhythm, our sleep pattern. So that's the main mechanism of action. Unlike trazodone, it doesn't normally give much sedation and also it doesn't provide any weight kind. And lastly, lithium. So, the mechanism of action of lithium is quite complex, but basically, lithium leads to some neuroplastic changes that ultimately they lead to some mood stabilization. So, lithium can be quite helpful for people that not only present depression, but also some maniac episodes, so patients with bipolar disorder, and lithium is a drug that contains a very narrow therapeutical window so patients should be monitored for the lithium levels 
and those should be between 0.6 to 0.8 millimoles per liter normally. Then if the patients go really higher than that, they can present some toxicity from lithium and toxicity from lithium presents normally with shaking of the hands, people may have some unexplained confusion, unexplained drowsiness and also some vomiting and diarrhea. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors are barely used in depression nowadays. They inhibit the enzyme that does the breakdown of the monoamines, but I've talked a lot more about monoamine oxidase inhibitors on previous videos, so make sure you check that one out. And as a bonus, because you watched this video until the end, I'll just tell you about ketamine. Basically, this is a novel drug that is based on a novel mechanism of action. It basically antagonizes the effect of glutamate, and glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter. So there are some studies going on and they are trying to find some drugs similar to ketamine, but with less side effects. Lastly, electroconvulsive therapy. Basically, this is a novel therapy as well for severe cases of depression. Uh, and it's used for patients with severe depression where like controlled seizures are produced in the patients and it helps in depression. All right, so if you would like me to talk more about these novel therapies that are emerging, just let me know in the comment section below. Also use the comment section to leave me your thoughts. Just let me know about other topics that you would like me to bring here. I'm planning to bring another video on antidepressants, bring some case studies so we can put all this information together and think together about the solution for those case studies. So stay tuned. See you soon. To infinity and beyond!